All right, let's take a look at an axial piston motor. So again, we can tell this one's a motor. We have an A and a B port. They're of equal size, so we just have the, the shipping plugs that came with it. This one's off of a Volvo A30 rock truck. This one's the fan motor for the air to go through the intercooler and the hydraulic cooler. So we have our A and our B ports. Those are going to be our oil flow ports uh, from our directional control valve. And then we have our third port right here, which would be our case drain port on the outside here so we can have our keyed shaft so again anytime we have a keyed shaft then that's our point of failure so in the event that we have a mechanical bind what will happen is that we will break or split that key and then our drive or driven component will end up being able to spin free from the motor in the event of mechanical binding and this one of course just has a lock nut that would hold that fan blade on and then the ability to put the cotter pin in to hold the fan blade in place. So if we take a look at this one, we'll pull the screws off the end of the housing. And as we do this, we'll end up seeing, uh, I'll leave two screws until the end, uh, 100 opposed from each other, or just holding the housing and we're gonna be able to see it expand. And so then that's gonna make a point about how our volumetric efficiency is increased in this axial piston motor with our block spring. At this point, it would be great to maybe use a little power tool, but the problem is with these little cap screws, they strip really easily. And so it's best not to use a power tool when you want to put a component like this back together and it'll prevent you any damaging of the threads. All right, so now I'm going to turn this sideways and I've got two screws left and we see a little bit of a crack forming here between the end housing and the rest of the housing or the rest of the motor and as I back these screws off that's going to get larger. Alright so under spring tension now as I pull this last cap screw we're going to see that end housing pull away. Now it's pulled away. All right. So we'll mark the housing. This one's actually, I'm going to rely on the paint uh, to realign this, but we can take off the end housing and that's where we'll see the pressure plate, the pressure plate or port plate that's going to be pushed against the rotating group. We have our uh, support bearing right here. We have a spacer uh, behind that support bearing. And then we're going to be able to push the whole rotating group out, including the swash plate. So in this case, the swash plate is actually pinned with that hole down in the end of the housing. It's a flat housing, but the swash plate angle is actually determined by the swash plate itself. And that swash plate's got a pin hole right there that's going to hold it in orientation. So our swash plate's not able to spin inside this housing. It's pinned in place. Now the shaft again, our rotating group is going to rotate on our two taper roller bearings. So what we can see is as our rotating group turns around, our cylinder block is being spun because hydraulic oil is being sent in on through the A port here, causing the piston to travel down the swash plate, which causes this group to rotate in this sort of upward direction. And then if we sent oil in the other way, so if I sent oil in the B port in this top side, it's gonna cause the piston to extend starting at the top and it's gonna move this block to move down as I'm looking at it in this way. Now, clockwise and counterclockwise is always determined by looking at the output shaft and seeing the motor move. So our swash plate here, because it's pinned and held in the housing, is a fixed displacement. And so what we see if we actually pull the output shaft from here, we can see the center splines. Those splines are actually splined to the splines in the center block. And that's how our hydraulic oil coming in on the piston 
causing the piston to move, rotates the block, and the block then is splined to the output shaft, causing the output shaft to turn of the motor. So that's how we create this rotation. So our swash plate is fixed stationary in this housing, and it's actually the hydraulic oil coming in on the back side of the piston, causing the piston to extend, travel down the swash plate that causes this motor to convert the hydraulic energy into mechanical energy. If we rebuild these and work on them, one of the things we ought to do is work in a very clean environment. And when we're working in a clean environment, managing our contamination, we also wanna make sure we orient or mark the shoe plate right here, where our piston shoes are being fitted to. Mark that orientation of the pistons to the shoe plate, the shoe plate to the cylinder block, so that when we take it apart, we can actually put it all back together in that correct spot. Now this one's been taken apart multiple times, it's a training aid, and so it has multiple times been taken apart and put together incorrectly or out of alignment, and so in this case I'm not gonna worry about it. At this point, that ship has already sailed. One of the things we have to be mindful of when we're working on an axial motor like this is the spherical washer that actually sits on these pins and the pins right here are actually pushing down on the coil spring in the block and this is what's allowing us to create that pressure or tension that pushes the cylinder block against the port plate which is increasing our volumetric efficiency. And so when we're rebuilding it, we need to make sure we get this spherical washer in the correct position, which is going to be underneath our shoe plate, not on top. If we put it on top, we have multiple training aids that have been broken doing this. What happens is we actually crack the shoe plate because it's trying to bend around and it's not built that way. So it cracks and breaks as it's sitting on there. So we got to make sure we get our spherical washer underneath. Once we get it underneath, we reinstall our pistons, having a nice film of the oil that's actually going to be moved by the motor or uh, the pump or in the system. And then what we can see is that now our shoe plate sits on top of that spherical washer right there. And then of course we can line everything back up and that would be ready to be reassembled. Of course, I would have had to put the swash plate back in place first. So when we take a look at the port plate, or the pressure plate that's actually fitted to the end housing and this one is actually pinned in place there's a pin right here and that pin is actually fitted to a recess in the shoe or port plate and I know when we see this we want to say oh that brass surface should be the other way this this plate must have been installed upside down but it's not that pin right there fits into that recess exactly the way it's built and we also can see the feathering grooves of our port plate right here that are used to prevent hydraulic locking and also cavitation in the direction of rotation. We can see that the feathering grooves are on both sides, so there's four of them, meaning that this motor is meant to go in either direction. The fact that we see these ports are reinforced on both sides of the port plate tell us they're meant to have pressure on both sides, again, reminding us that this is a port plate for a motor. So when we take a look at this end housing, what we're seeing is behind this pressure plate, which was pinned in place, behind this pressure plate, so we see the ports A and B ports, are simply these cast grooves, and they're gonna connect directly to the A and the B ports. So you can just see the seal pick showing through there and so we see there's nothing complicated about that it's just simply a and b connect to their respective sides and so it's actually this hole right here we can take a look at this hole and this hole come together and they actually leak back where they are how the internal oil that's leaked from the motor itself that's used for lubrication on the taper roller bearings how that actually gets out and so it's getting out through our K-strain port right here. As we take a look at the seal on the drive shaft of this motor, what we can actually see is it's a dual lip seal, so it's got one lip that's facing outside, and that's actually going to look or act as a, as a dust seal or a, a seal that's going to prevent external contamination from getting into the motor. And then the internal lip 
right here is actually the one that's going to be spring loaded and that's sitting in the oil side. So we always make sure that the spring side of our lip seal is going to go towards the oil so as the any pressure builds up in the motor, although it shouldn't be much, is going to make this lip actually squeeze against the shaft making the seal act more effective. So when we think about the pressure that these lip seals are good for, typically think about engine oil pressure as being the max limit of what our lip seals are good for. So somewhere in that 30 to 100 psi range would be the maximum you'd want to see in the case. And so the only time you would actually see that case oil increase to the point where that lip seal fails is if somebody had forgotten to put the case drain line in and instead left this plug in place. So if you forgot to put the third line in and run it back to tank, that's going to cause a buildup of pressure inside the motor which will result in that lip seal failing to an external leak.